Good afternoon. My name is Cindy Water, and this is the Napa Valley Unified School District Board of Education. Uh, the NVUSD Board of Education is holding a special board meeting. Interpretation in Spanish is available for tonight's virtual board meeting. Our inter interpreter is Claudia Lindgren. The interpreter will now translate the directions on our English channel so our Spanish-speaking families may hear the instructions. Buenas tardes a todos, bienvenidos. Uh, es un placer estar con ustedes. Uh, los servicios de interpretación en español van a estar disponibles de una manera simultánea. En unos segundos se van a encender los servicios de interpretación. Favor de poner atención a la parte inferior de su pantalla. Ustedes van a notar un globo terráqueo. Si pueden hacer un clic en ese icono, por favor, es un símbolo de mundo. Y se les va a dar la opción de elegir el idioma de español. Uh, si ustedes tienen acceso a esta junta por medio de su celular o alguna pantalla, alguna tableta, ustedes van a notar tres puntos en la parte superior a mano derecha de su pantalla o también Uh, en la parte inferior de su pantalla, abajo de los tres puntos, van a notar una palabra que dice more o más. Hagan un clic en ella. De nuevo se va a lanzar el globo terráqueo. Otro clic y favor de elegir el idioma de español. Cualquier duda, estamos a sus órdenes. Gracias. Thank you. Back to you. Thank you. Now, we, can we please start with an attendance roll call from Vera Morales, Executive Assistant? Yes. Trustee Water? Present. Trustee Reiser? Present. Trustee Shu? Present. Trustee Gracia? Present. Trustee Jankowitz? Present. Quorum present. Thank you. Thank you. And now we will have the flag salute by Jackie Clayton. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, and now for an announcement. The open session segment of the meeting is being live streamed and recorded via Zoom. We will be transitioning into closed session after the open session presentation tonight. Our meeting will be adjourned here in the boardroom, but not online. So I need an approval of the special set <laughs> special session agenda. Move to approve. Second. Okay, we've got a, a first by Trustee Gracia, a second by Trustee Chu. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion passes. And now to part B, presentations and discussion items, business services. Napa Valley Unified School District, SFID number one, bond feasibility presentation. Um, yes, yeah, so good afternoon, trustees. We have um, two of our partner consultants that will be kicking off to this afternoon's presentation. First, we're going to start out with Jeremy Hauser from Team Civics, and then we'll be joined by um, Timothy McClarney, who's from True North. Take it away, Jeremy. Thank you, Dr. Mercedi and President Water, members of the board. Uh, Jeremy Hauser, I'm a partner with Team Civics. We've been working with the district for the better part of the last year to both explore the feasibility of a bond measure in the first school facilities improvement district in Napa, and also prepare a potential measure for the ballot this fall. Um, we conducted some polling with Tim McClarney of True North Research early this year in January. We presented those results to you uh, in February. Since then, we've been doing a lot of stakeholder outreach and engagement to help your community better understand how a bond measure might address the facilities needs in your schools and begin to develop a plan towards potentially placing a measure on the ballot to address those needs. In May, we re-engaged with uh, Dr. McClarney to do some tracking research, to check back in with the community, to understand if perceptions around the need had changed, if tax sensitivities had changed, and help present you all with a recommendation whether or not to move forward with placing a measure on the ballot this fall. Now, the deadline to qualify for the ballot is June 25th, um, which is a week from today, which is why um, after this presentation today, we're going to recommend uh, 
potentially adopting a resolution on June 20th, two days from now, calling that November election. Uh, so with that, I will kick it over to Tim to walk us through the numbers and the research and the key findings, and we can help discuss next steps. Great. Thank you, Jeremy. And uh, good afternoon, members of the board. Tim McClarney with True North Research. Um, if it pleases the board, I'd like to share my screen so that I can... Oh, you've got it on your end. Never mind. Perfect. Uh, so you have in front of you um, the PowerPoint presentation I'm going to walk through today. As Jeremy mentioned, we had the privilege of working on a baseline survey for the district, looking at a bond measure back in January. It looked promising. So here we are five months later. A lot has happened in between this time, and you're quickly approaching that filing deadline for a potential November measure. It makes sense to check back in with the community, understand the degree to which you know, sentiments around uh, the bond measure may have, have fluctuated or changed during this time. And as I go through this presentation, I welcome questions from the board along the way or at the end, whichever is your preference. Next slide, please. Uh, this next slide sort of just summarizes what we just talked about in terms of the purpose. Um, and so I think we can, we've covered that. We can go to the, the next slide on methodology. So in terms of the methodology, what we've using the same methodology here that we always use when we're, we're looking at potential revenue measures, and it was the same methodology that we used for your baseline poll back in January. Uh, the first question we always ask ourselves is what elections is this survey going to be on or this measure going to be on? Because we want to make sure that the profile of voters that we're speaking with is representative of that likely voter universe. Different elections have different turnouts, and one of the nice properties of the upcoming presidential general election this November. It has a very high turnout, the highest turnout th that you'll have in any election during a four-year cycle. And so what we did is we identified individuals who are what we call likely November voters, individuals we expect to cast a ballot this upcoming November. We used a process then called stratified and clustered random sampling to ensure that the sample that we pulled for our survey matches the profile of that likely November universe on all the dimensions that we know drive how voters tend to behave when it comes to tax measures. So the balance by age and gender, partisanship, household party type, and where they live within your district in our sample matches that of the likely November universe. Once we pulled our sample, we used three different recruiting methods, email, text, and telephone. Um, the invitations that go out to individuals that we've randomly sampled have a unique URL for each individual. That ensures that only those individuals that were part of our sample that we've reached out to, to take the survey can do so. They can complete one survey only. Um, folks have the option of doing this online or by telephone as well as in English or in Spanish. Uh, we had actually uh, contracted for, I think we'd actually contracted for 400 interviews. We walked back in the door with 562. So that's just bonus to the district. Having a sample of 562 chosen at random allows us to have a somewhat smaller margin of error than we otherwise would have. In this case, it's plus or minus 4.1% at the 95% confidence level. What that means is we can be 95% confident that the results we'll talk about today are within 4.1% of what we would have found had we spoken with all of your uh, likely voters. Next slide, please. So on to the results. This first slide shows the results of what we call our importance of issues question, where for each of the issues you see there on the slide, we simply ask voters to tell us how important is this to them? Is it extremely important, very important, somewhat important, or not at all important? Um, this is a great warm-up question, just kind of gets voters into the groove of taking the survey, but it's also an opportunity for us to understand how that topic of improving the quality of education in local public schools stacks up against some of these other issues that also compete for tax dollars, things like maintaining local streets and roads and improving public safety. And in particular, we look closely at how the issue of improving the quality of education in local public schools stacks up against the issue of preventing local tax increases. Rough rule of thumb, but makes a lot of sense. The more importance that voters place on the issue of education relative to the issue of preventing local tax increases, the better positioned you are to move forward with some type of education-related measure. And as you can see here, that gap is 20 points here. We have 82%. Uh, indicating that improving the quality of education in local public schools was either extremely or very important compared to 62% for preventing local tax increases. So that's a good gap. That's pretty typical of what we're seeing this cycle. If you look right above preventing local tax increases, you see the issue of repairing and upgrading aging school facilities. That checks in above preventing local tax increases, not by a lot though, at 66%, but is also well below the 82% you see for improving the quality of education in local public schools. I point this out as I think I did during the baseline poll results. 
Um, not because it's unusual, but it is a, a really good reminder to us that although bonds are about facilities, at the end of the day, what your voters care the most about is what happens inside those facilities when it comes to your schools. So we always want to be sort of connecting the dots between what it is you're fixing or improving uh, at your school facilities and how that connects to your core mission of educating students. Next slide, please. So after that warm up question, we get right down to business with what we call the initial ballot test. And the idea here is before we get any deeper into the interview and we start talking in more detail about uh, possible tax rates that could be associated with this measure, conveying the types of projects that can be funded in more detail, as well as presenting arguments pro and con, we want to present to respondents a mock-up of what we think that 75-word ballot statement could look like and get their reaction. The initial ballot test is a really good gauge of where your voters are at in the current climate with the information they have available to them currently with respect to this proposal. And so uh, shown here is the language that we tested. And on the next slide are the results. So at the initial ballot test, we had 55% of voters say that they would support this proposal. You had 39% opposed. Yet about 6% who were unsure. So in the state of California, for a Prop 39 bond to be successful, you need 55%. So we're sitting right there on the number uh, that is needed to be uh, for passage. This is about 3% lower than where we were at the baseline poll back in January. Now, that said, we also did something a little different in this survey than we did then. Um, and one of the sort of the there's, there's a lot of advantages to a presidential general election that we're looking at this November in terms of turnout. And that's why you see a lot of agencies try and target November measures. At the same time, we also know that these November ballots tend to be kind of crowded, right? That there's lots of agencies targeting the high turnout election. And so you tend to get lots of tax measures on the ballot. And so in this, measure, in this survey, we also exposed half of our sample to several other tax measures that are going to be on the ballot to get an understanding how support for your proposal may be influenced to some degree by the types of other things that they would encounter on the, on the November ballot. And so on the next slide, you see that this crowded ballot simulation in the space of the survey did have a bit of an impact. When we tested your measure by itself, we had 62% support. For the set, half the sample that we expose them to the idea that you're going to have multiple sales tax measures on the ballot this November, local uh, sales tax measures, um, you can see that that cooled down the initial response to your, your bond measure to 49%. A um, couple of things to keep in mind here. Number one, this tends to be a pretty tough test, this crowded ballot scenario, tends to be a pretty tough test of the reality of what happens on a November, a November ballot because we're forcing respondents to look at these other measures first in that order and then get to yours. And although that may be actually the way they, the order they appear in the ballot, most of the time when voters are looking at their ballots these days, they're, they're actually sort of scanning them and looking at everything that's on there, right? So they're kind of aware of the different local measures that are on there. So there's a little more of a sequencing effect here uh, than we would actually see on the ballot. So it's a little bit of a tougher, tougher test. The other thing I want to point out is in the baseline poll, when we didn't do a crowded ballots test, we found 58% support back in January for this proposal. In this survey, when we didn't do the crowded ballot test, we had 62% among that subgroup. So we're about four points higher on the natural with respect to this proposal than we were at the initial ballot test back in January for the baseline poll, right? So it's that hard tests that we're delivering to half of your sample uh, where we're forcing them to go through these other measures, which is why obviously on the left side of that slide, we're low and the overall is sitting at 55. Next slide, please. Um, so this uh, bond is proposed as a school facilities improvement district bond, meaning it's for a portion of your district. And so to make it clear to voters, since American Canyon has already had their bond recently that all the money from this measure would be spent uh, in the Napa area. Uh, but we we actually told respondents that that very fact, that all the money from the measure that we were describing would be spent repairing and improving local schools in your area, including the city of Napa and surrounding unincorporated areas. None of the money will be spent in American Canyon as they pass their own bond in 2022. And knowing this, 
how would they vote on this measure? You can see that we get a little bit of a boost with that information with voters in this SFID. It, it's interesting. This is consistent with what we have seen in past surveys for the district within this SFID, and that is the idea of the money staying local to this SFID doesn't give as big of a boost here as it did say in American Canyon. When we did the polling for American Canyon, you saw the moment those voters understood the money was going to stay in American Canyon. We had about a six, seven point boost and it never went away. In this other SFID, the remainder part of your district, perhaps because it is so large, uh, this area, we're just not seeing as big of a boost. You get a couple, get a couple points from that. Okay, next slide, please. So, Naturally, support for a bond measure can depend on the price tag, right? The higher the tax rate, all other things being equal, the lower the level of support you can expect for a proposal. And we want to make it clear in this survey that bonds mean taxes, just in case they somehow didn't capture that out of the original 75-word initial ballot statement. And we also want to test two different possible tax rates that could be associated with the measure to get understanding how, as you zero voters' attention in on the price tag, how that impacts their support. So we tested $24 per 100,000 assessed valuation at the top, and we also tested $19 per 100,000 uh, assessed valuation on the lower part. And as you can see it, there is a bit of tax rate sensitivity here um, between these two rates, and both and the support level at both rates here is lower than what we saw at the initial ballot test. That is a pattern, once again, we always see, because we know that this question tends to be a conservative read on voter support for a bond measure for a couple of reasons. One, we are putting the blinders on the voter and we're focusing their attention on the price tag. Um, you know, when you think about what a bond proposal is, that 75 word ballot statement, it's a lot of things that you're going to do and benefits to the community. And one part of that package is the price tag. So they're kind of voting on it as a bundle. When you pull the price tag out, set it aside and focus voters attention on it, it always has this sort of wet blanket uh, effect when it comes to support for a measure. The other reason why we know that this particular question tends to be a conservative read on support for a proposal is because, you know, when I tell somebody that th if this measure passes, it would increase the property taxes on their home by $24 per 100,000 of assessed valuation, not everybody knows what you mean, right? You have to know what uh, assessed valuation means. You have to have some estimate of what the AV is for your property. You have to be able to do math pretty quickly in the space of the interview to estimate what this sort of means on an annual basis. Understandably, not everybody's good at doing that. And there's a certain percentage of voters who they know you're talking about price tag. They don't know what it adds up to and they will hedge. They will say no, we're not sure at this question where if they knew the true cost of the measure, they'd be a yes. And one of the reasons we know that is because on the next slide, we come at it a little differently. We say, all right, and this is the left column. Let me put it another way. If you knew that this measure would cost the typical homeowner about $116 per year, would you vote yes or no? The $116 per year is that $24 per 100,000 assessed valuation tax rate multiplied times the median assessed value for a residential property in your district. So it's what that middle property owner would pay. And as you can see here, that when you go ahead and do the math for folks and you pr put the price tag in a term that everybody can understand, you get a somewhat more positive response here, right? We have 52% support at $116, whereas on the prior slide, when we had the rate that lines up with that, we had 45% support. Similar exercise on the right, only here, we're extrapolating that $19 per 100,000 assessed valuation tax rate out for the median homeowner. That adds up to $92 per year. And at $92 per year, you can see we've got 54% support for this proposal. So all of this is information which is, I think, helpful for answering what is sometimes the, you know, the toughest question that you have to answer when you decide to go for a bond, and that is where do you price it, right? At what level does it make sense to set the rate? Okay, so next slide, please. So after the tax threshold section, we dig into the projects and improvements section of the survey. And here, we're trying to do a couple things. One is we are starting to now educate this respondent more about what this measure would accomplish. Um, up until this point, we only had the 75 word ballot statement to describe this proposal. And only about half of the words in that statement were focused on projects. And so we couldn't say a lot about what the bond would do. By unpacking it into a series of potential uses, you're giving this respondent now a much better idea about what the proposal is about. It also allows us to understand of all the ways you're thinking about spending the money, 
how do they feel about each of those ways and which of these kind of rise up to the top of the list in terms of their priorities. One thing that sort of jumps off the page here is you'll see that everything we tested, tested really well, right? We have better than 70 uh, percent, almost three quarters or more of your voters saying that they would favor spending some of the money on each of these items. There is a little bit of a natural break, though, that happens right in the middle of this graphic. So the top five projects, you can see the the percentage who strongly favor or the intensity of the favorability for those items is a bit higher than the ones below. And when you look at those things, they're all the things we typically see rise to the top of the list in voters' priorities when we're looking at bond measures for schools around the state. So basic repairs to your facilities, roofs, plumbing, electrical, right? Bringing your older schools up to new school standards in terms of health codes, safety codes, and ADA access, getting rid of hazardous materials if you've got them, and also a focus on uh, STEM and career tech, right? Those are the top three, five projects here, and that's pretty typical of what we see. Next slide, please. So if you as a board were to choose to move forward with a bond measure this November, you're going to have an election cycle. And during that election cycle, there will be a lot of discussion and debate about this proposal in the community. You'll have advocates who will step up and argue to their friends and neighbors about why this is needed and why they should vote yes. You might also get some opponents who step up and you know tell everybody it's a horrible idea and we shouldn't be doing it. And here's why. For this survey to be a reliable gauge of the feasibility of a bond measure, we need to kind of simulate that discussion and debate in the space of the poll. So we have some understanding not only of where your voters are at on the natural with respect to this proposal, but where do they land after they've heard positives and they've also heard negatives. So shown here are the positive arguments that we tested. Um, one of the things that we have seen this cycle is that if you can be a bit more specific about what your facility needs are in these arguments, kind of paint a picture for voters who probably many of whom haven't stepped onto your campuses in a long time, it can have a big positive impact and sort of resonate with them. So uh, the number one issue here or argument was that there's more than 100 portable classrooms at your schools that are 25 years old or more and falling apart. Many have structural damage, water leaks and mold, and it's expensive to keep repairing these units we need to, um, this bond to remove decaying portables. What we have seen when it comes like uh, portable replacement, for example, is if you just say we're gonna replace portables, it's a real third tier kind of project. Why? Because it, it almost sounds wasteful, right? Oh, we're just getting rid of or replacing portable units. When you can add a little detail to that, right? You can talk about how many you have, how old they are, and in particular, the problems that you get with, with portables that are 25 plus years old, it's a game changer in terms of how voters think about that type of a project. And that's why that that's your number one positive argument. So at this point in the survey, voters have heard more about this proposal than we did at the initial ballot test, right? We had a chance to talk in detail about the tax rates that had a chilling effect on support as we saw, but we had a chance to come back, talk in more detail about the types of projects that could be funded. We conveyed positive arguments on behalf of this proposal. We've yet to get to the negatives. And so we circle back on the next slide to what we call our interim ballot test. We say, all right, now that you've heard a bit more, where do you stand? And you can see here at the interim ballot test, we're ticked up. We're about 56% support for this bond, 39% opposed, and about 6% unsure. When you compare this to where we were in the baseline poll, we're now two points higher than we were back in January. And that's even with the crowded ballot simulation for half of your voters. And then we get to the negatives on the next slide. The idea behind the negatives is I'm going to pepper respondents with a series of negative arguments, the type of arguments that are designed to get voters, to give voters reasons to vote no, because I want to know, should you move forward? Should you get organized opposition that do a good job getting their message out there? How might that ultimately impact how voters view your proposal? So shown here are the negatives that we tested. Uh, you can see we didn't pull any punches. We tested the top five strongest arguments that we could come up with, both from past research as well as what we're seeing this cycle. Uh, and you can see some of these negatives do get some traction. The real question though is what happens uh, after that, and that's on the next slide. So after hitting them with those negatives, support for the measure cools down about five points to 51%. So we're sitting about four points below that 55% threshold that's required for passage. This is one point better than where we were in the baseline poll back in January. And again, 
that's even though half the sample has been, um, you know, given that tougher crowded ballot simulation at the, at the forefront of the interview. So we've done some polling for the district in the past um, on this, and I wanted to share on the next slide kind of some historical perspective. So, and we're just focusing on this particular SFID. Back in 2022, when we did the baseline poll uh, for that measure in this FID, you can see we did an initial, an interim, and a final ballot test, right? And we had bracketed support between 55% and 50% between the initial ballot test and the final ballot test. On election day, you wound up coming in right near the top of what we had tested at 54.6. Now, obviously, 55 is the cutoff, so you narrowly miss passage, but it's encouraging that you actually performed at the upper range of what your polling said was showing uh, earlier that cycle. We did a baseline poll for the district back in January, and as you can see during that poll, a little more of a range. We started at 58, dropped to 54, dropped to 50, right? So we had this range that looked like that. Here we are now at the tracking poll on the far right, that's the light green bars over there. And we're seeing numbers that look similar to what we saw in 2022, where flat between the initial and the interim, 55, 56%, the final at 51%. So that just kind of gives you uh, some perspective. And what it what it shows to me is that, I mean, your, your electorate's been awfully consistent, right, in terms of how they view this proposal um, and that, um, you know, you're, you're hovering in that range, either a little bit above or a little bit below the 55, depending on the scenario. Um, but we haven't seen large swings much above that. And we haven't seen at any point you get below 50%. So a lot of consistency. All right. So next slide. And this should be, I believe, the last one. So what does all this mean? I'm going to circle back to that sort of overarching question that you know, we see as the main motivator for why you do this type of research, which is to understand, is it feasible? If you as a board were to choose to move forward with a November measure, does it have a reasonable chance of success? I think the answer to that in this case, when you look at these numbers is yes, we see a path, um, but it's gonna require robust outreach and engagement, right? Um, you're gonna have to continue that, not just as a district moving forward, but there's gonna have to be a solid independent campaign on behalf of this proposal during the election cycle. Um, it also is facing a somewhat difficult election environment in 2024, right? This is not, uh, you know, there's not one of those feel-good elections that where everyone's thinking, you know, there's not a lot of controversy out there. The economy's running great. And those are the kind of, of you know, elections that are kind of easier to win in. You know, this, this election's going to have some challenges. And so, uh, and we recognize that. But at the same time, when you look at the polling data and when you dig in behind the results and you look at the support levels by voting propensity, the high turnout that you're seeing this November is definitely helpful. And so we see a path, but, you know, it's not without risk. Uh, that said, I think 2024, November 2024 is your is your best option among the next three or four years that you, you have in front of you. So why do we say we see a path? Well, that's all the things you see listed there under the positive signs, right? We know your voters care about education. It's one of the top rated issues when we ask them what's most important to them. We see that the initial ballot test based just on the 75 words, you are at the 55% you need to be successful. The projects and improvements that you're thinking about funding with this bond are all wildly popular, right? Voters like what your project list is. We have positive arguments that resonate and importantly, these lower propensity voters, right? These are the voters who are going to show up this November who probably aren't going to show up in 2026. These voters exhibit stronger support for this proposal. And so this is, again, one of those reasons why agencies tend to go for the high turnout elections. It's because it changes the profile of your electorate in a way that tends to make it all other things being equal a little more tax friendly. Now, there are also some challenges that we just need to keep in mind. One is tax rate sensitivity. Um, we, we know, you know, there's that out there in the community and, and we have to, uh, I think, make wise decisions in terms of, you know, what tax rate you choose and how you move forward and in particularly how you talk about the tax implications of a bond so that they aren't confused by the rate. They understand what the true cost of this is. We do see that opposition arguments resonate, right? And so that sort of cooled us down from, uh, 
you know, being above water at the interim ballot test and below water at the final ballot test. And then the electoral climate, which is probably the biggest challenge, in my opinion, is, you know, we're heading into what's going to be a, a pretty hyper-partisan, bitter presidential contest that's going to set the tone here in, uh, for the nation, as well as in um, in California. And, you know, the hyper-partisanship is something that, you know, can, can old... we can affect kind of how people view local measures, right? So we want to make sure that we're getting out there and uh, your school bond is not a partisan issue, right? It's about your school facilities. It's about your community. And we want to make sure that that message is that way. And so, and also there's going to be some other local measures as well as statewide measures that could create a little bit of headwind. So, you know, um, again, I, I see this as, you know, anytime you're looking at poll numbers like this and you're thinking about a measure, um, you know, if this is plan A, okay, is there a plan B and what does plan B look like, right? I, I think uh, if plan B is thinking about a 2026 measure, I, I think you're much better off looking at November 2024 and, and taking advantage of, of that higher turnout. So that's the end of my presentation. I welcome questions from the Board of Thorarney. First, uh, we're going to have public comment on this. Um, do we have any people um, waiting uh, online to make a public comment about this presentation? No, there is no public comment on this presentation. Oh, okay, thank you. Well, board, any comments here? You have a question. Trustee Grassi has a question. Yeah, uh, you mentioned that you feel like 2024 is better than 2026. If we chose not to go in 2024, would your recommendation then be to wait till 2028? Well, I mean, well, I don't have a crystal ball, right? Looking ahead to see what 2028 would be like. Um, what I can say is just the looking at the voters that are turning out in November of 2024 that we would not expect to show up in 2026 because it's not a presidential election. It's a gubernatorial election. It's going to have a lower turnout that all other things being equal, you're a bit disadvantaged, right? Because you don't get the benefit of those voters showing up and casting ballots on your measure. Um, and so you're right. If you don't go this cycle, it, you may be in a four-year wait to the next opportunity in 2028 where you're going to be able to take advantage of that high turnout again. And if, if I may, I completely agree with Tim. We likely would not wait until 2028 to explore the answer to that question, we'd want to keep 2026 on the table and test it as a possibility. But based on what we're seeing here, I think we both feel that the answer to that question for 2026 would, would not be as strong as it is for 2024. Thank you. Any other board members? No. Well, thank, you. thank you very much for this presentation. Thank you. A great meeting. Great. Thank, Thank you. you, Tim and Jeremy. We appreciate you coming in to this afternoon. Thanks so much. Okay, so um, public comment. Next, we'll have public comment on closed session. Um, the, uh, the, we are going to be having a closed session after this. So do we have any public comments on the closed session coming up? There is no public comment on closed session. Well, thank you. So we will now adjourn to closed session.